Philippians. Yes, we're done with Ephesians. Philippians is next, even though what was probably written side by side with Ephesians that we just finished? Who can tell me? Colossians, very likely, right? And also, what other letter? Philemon. And uh, typically we have, I don't know if you know this, but the writings of the New Testament are arranged in a particular order. Do you, do you know what that order is? Of the writings of Paul, do you know how they're arranged, the order? It's just, it goes from biggest to smallest. It just so happens that sometimes it's in chronological order, but sometimes it's not. Okay, sometimes it's not. I want to begin where we've been beginning so that we can continue to keep fresh on our minds the foundation of our faith and the things that we need to be, you might say, uh, overflowing with in our daily lives. The gospel message. And so let's look at that very quickly. Jesus is first. He's the creator. He is... The beginning and the end. Uh, the Bible is all about him. And uh, he was introduced right after sin was introduced, which is the problem for all mankind that separates us from God. The promise that he would come and be the solution and defeat our enemy and bruise the head of the serpent. The promise was made to Abraham. Then the promise was made to the children of Israel through the law of Moses. And his sacrifice was foretold in specificity and how it would happen in Isaiah 53. This sacrifice was the manifestation of God's love. It is what brought Jesus to earth, John 3, 16. And Jesus came and showed us what it, was, what it meant to really be human. Uh, not to live for ourselves, but to live the way that God wants us to live for him. A perfect human so that he could be a perfect sacrifice. His sufficiency is shown in contrast to the insufficiency of the old law and of its sacrifices throughout Scripture. Uh, primarily in the writings of Paul and in Hebrews. Uh, Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection is the shorthand of the gospel. You find in 1 Corinthians 15. And it is, you might say, the fulcrum, the middle point. It is everything points from the, from the beginning of time to it, and everything after it points back to it. The death, burial, and resurrection, the crucifixion, burial, and resurrection. And, of course, this is the display of God's love to us, which draws us to him and it's described by Jesus this drawing of us to God and submitting to him it's described as the new birth he wants us to be made like Christ he wants us to join in with his perfect life his perfect sacrifice by becoming a sacrifice ourselves this process of course is believing that he actually is the sacrifice that he is the son of God and that by submitting ourselves to him in faithful trust we repent from how we want to live and we live how he wants to live we make him our Lord, we confess him as such, we're united with his death, burial, and resurrection in baptism, and that is the new birth. Uh, that is the simple process, it's not complicated, even though it's kind of taken and parts are pulled out and thrown around and tied together differently than it's written in scripture and so many of our, uh, so many of our friends in the religious world. But that's it, that's the moment of the new birth. And of course, when we are born again, we become a new spiritual creature or creation, 2 Corinthians 5, 17, and we live a new life, which is described as the fruit of the Spirit, Galatians 5, 22 and following. And uh, this life is a life of rejoicing because there's no condemnation, and this life of rejoicing because we're not condemned is the life that we're called to share with others. And of course, we're not left alone. God sent the Holy Spirit who has given us the foundation in the New Testament of our faith that we can share so we can know what Jesus said, we can know what the truth is, and of course, we await for his return. He's the beginning and the end. Uh, he created the world, and when, when the world is done, he will take it and wrap it up like a cloth and throw it away. Which brings us to Philippians. Philippians. When we think of the letter to the church in Philippi, we need to think of it within the context of the gospel message or the overview of the gospel or the scheme of redemption. How does it fit in? Who are these people and what has, what has happened to them because of the gospel? And what, has, what, what is it that Paul needs to write to them about? I have some introductory material. We have like about 31 minutes left here, which is not, not too bad. And it's very likely that the material that I want to cover will take two or three weeks. 
because I want to look at, number one, I want to look at, give us a good backdrop, or at least a very primary sort of a backdrop of just the city and its history. Then I want us to look at the, the historical background within the New Testament of interactions that Paul had in the city of Philippi, the people he met there, the church that he established there, to set up the proper historical and biblical context for when we actually look at a brief overview of the book and its themes. So those are those three things. Really a historical background of, of the city, a textual or, or New Testament background of the city, and interaction with the people there, and then a, an introductory look, look at the book itself or the letter itself before we get even get to verse 1. Now we're going to look at some verses within it, but before we actually start to dive in, I want us to have a proper background and context for this. Now I have up here on the screen, this is the map that I've shown many times. It's got the, the, uh, the missionary journeys of Paul. The first one, of course, goes into Galatia. The second and third ones go to Galatia and then to Macedonia, then into Greece or to Achaia, Greece, Achaia. What is present-day Greece is what we call Macedonia and Achaia today. Um, and then, of course, he comes back, and those both of those missionary journeys comes back to Antioch and to Jerusalem. At the end of the third missionary journey, he doesn't go to Antioch. He just goes straight to Jerusalem, where he's in prison, Caesarea, then sent to Rome. He's in Caesarea a couple of years in prison. Then he goes to Rome. He's probably there for a couple of years, I think. I believe that's what it, what it says. He's in Rome for there a couple of years in his first imprisonment in Rome. Now, um, if you can see right here on the second missionary journey is, uh, you look at the purple, and the purple here goes right here. Here's Philippi. As you can see, uh, it's across the Aegean Sea. This is the Aegean Sea. This is the Adriatic Sea. And it goes across Troas to Neapolis and Philippi. Uh, Philippi is, uh, is a very interesting city. In the, yes, sir, questions already? Well, that's a really good question. I'm really not sure. And I don't know that we can answer that just because the, uh, the story or the narrative that Luke tells in Acts, it, it has a lot of gaps in it. And Paul mentions, even in this letter, he mentions imprisonments that we probably don't even have records of. Uh, in 2 Corinthians, he makes a long list of imprisonments and shipwrecks and stonings and whippings and things like that that we don't really have any, um, any record of. Well, we have records of some of it, but not the, all of the things that he lists. So there's a lot of the story of Paul that we just don't have in the New Testament. So when we look at letters like this, that's a really good question because when we look at the letters, we're able to kind of see a little bit of the story that is untold by Luke because Paul tells us things that have been happening. So we know he goes to different places and does different things, even though it's not in the book of Acts. Like what I said, I think Sunday morning was um, about half of the writings of Paul are written after Acts 28. And so the story that's told in Acts covers about half of that time period of about half of the things that he writes. The, the second, the latter half of the things that he writes, which would be Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, Philemon, First and Second Timothy and Titus, those, those seven. Those seven are written after Acts 28. And you could say that Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and Philemon would have been written, um, you might say, during the time mentioned in Acts 28. But the story ends, and then we have that time period. Yes, sir? I'm glad you said that. A couple of things about the idea of him in ancient times being able to establish so many churches. A lot of times where he would go somewhere, unless he had some really, really serious opposition, he would stay there for a good period of time. Um, one thing that we find in the book of Philippians that is part of sort of the overview of it is the occasion of the book is him sending Epaphroditus with the letter to Philippi. 
And Epaphroditus had been a messenger to him. And, and so there's some insight into the, the seriousness of what it would take to be a messenger, to carry a letter over, uh, through mountains, ocean, um, dangerous cities for 1,000, 1,100 1, miles. And so I'm glad you said that because we sometimes take for granted the, just the, the capability of being able to send an email, something that was as simple as this letter, these four chapters of Philippians, was a, an extremely dangerous thing and difficult thing and could have taken months for someone to take and deliver. And so Epaphras, Epaphroditus is described as, as having become ill in his work doing that, even unto death. He almost died because of it. Another thing is this. Essentially, all of the churches we find in the New Testament, they don't exist anymore. Those congregations, there, there may be archaeological traces of them that we can guess about. There are places that are set up, usually they're, they're some type of an orthodox type of church establishment in that area. But what we would think of as just the simple New Testament church, we don't find those in Jerusalem. Not really. Not, not You might say not, I want you to think of it this way, not the church in Philippi that stayed the church in Philippi for the last two millennia. It just didn't. It, after a while, it just ceased to be. And all of the congregations did that, which tells us something about the idea of congregations that fizzle out eventually, even if they're established by Paul. And remember what we were talking about with, uh, with Joshua a couple, a couple of uh, two, three, three Sunday nights ago, that, that during his lifetime and the lifetime of all of the people who lived after him that he was a leader of, that they all follow, followed the law, and we're faithful to God throughout both of those generations. But then we have, we have the, uh, the book of, well, Judges, and then First and Second Samuel, First and Second Kings, First and Second Chronicles that show us a lot of unfaithfulness. And so we have this cycle and this routine of even faithful leaders establishing or leading people faithful to God, they would still over time, they would just be, they would become unfaithful. Which... The simple lesson is this. We have to be vigilant. When you're not vigilant to be faithful, then eventually subsequent generations will not be faithful. When we don't raise people who are faithful, then, then the, the group of faithful people in a particular area will just cease to be for a particular period of time until the seed of the... the, the uh, imperishable word come back in and Christians sprout from the gospel there again. Um, but that's one of the tragic things I've always thought about. With all the, the Christians and the congregations that we read of in, in the New Testament, they, they're not there anymore. All of the warnings that you have of the seven churches of Asia in Revelation 2 and 3, eventually God removed all of their candlesticks, so to speak. He removed... They, he rec didn't recognize them as faithful anymore. And so that, that's a sobering thing, and I appreciate you bringing that aspect up. And as we go through, we're going we're gonna to look at some of that. But I will tell you this, sort of at the outset of this letter, the letter of Philippians, unlike, say, the letter to Corinth, or the first letter to Corinth especially, the letter to the church at Philippi, Paul doesn't really call out any particular issues that they're guilty of. Unless you want to refer to chapter 4 where he calls out the couple of ladies who are having friction with one another. There is, doesn't seem to be, there seems to be a, a quite a bit of faithfulness at this place. And in fact, it seems to be one of those congregations that championed his work. Um, we'll get into some of that as we go, but I appreciate you bringing that up. Okay, yes sir.
I, I believe it all goes it all goes to whether or not we're actually taking seriously 2 Timothy 2.2 2, to train people who can train people. To train people. Are we, are we doing that? Are we, are we teaching people to be able to teach people? And, and by, you might say, uh, by implication, it would be older generations training younger, younger generations. Which means when, when the older generation is gone, the younger generation will have been trained. So on and so forth. It seems to be Joshua was training in righteousness. Paul was training in righteousness. When he was gone, he had quite an arsenal of Timothys and Tituses and people like that who had gone out and were doing a very substantial work of keeping people faithful. And, and so the, the threat is real. The threat is real. Complacency. Um, the, I, I, I was our brother John Orr he asked me actually to send him a letter of recommendation that he could give congregations to encourage them or let them know that we've been benefiting from some of the stuff that he taught us and he wanted me to give a little bit of a background of the area here and what is true of this area is what is true of many places around the world, which is this. At a certain point of prosperity and of success spiritually within a, within a Christian community, uh, just, like, just like with a, a teenager that grows up rich, they grow up not appreciating what it takes to, uh, to uh, build up that prosperity. You have people who were born into a prosperous time and didn't have to work for that. So we're talking spiritually here, but it works physically too. But spiritually, you have this truth of over time, there are those who they see everything is going great, even though they didn't really contribute to it because it was one or two or three generations before them in a particular area. We stand on the shoulders of giants. And so we live within that prosperity, and we feel like, oh, this is sort of just the way things go. This is a given. Sort of the same way that people think that the state of things in the United States is sort of just the way things always are throughout time and throughout civilizations, even though never in the history of the world has anything been like the last 250 years in the United States. It is an anomaly when it's not preserved, it just disappears quickly and you go back to tyranny and third world country status and that kind of stuff. Spiritually, it's the same way. When you, when you don't appreciate what it took and the hard work and the faithfulness and the training of those who were younger or older generations and you don't enter into mentorships and things like that, then what happens is, is you have a couple of generations that come along the line who just aren't equipped and aren't doing the work that built up the prosperity that they grew up in, and they begin to have a decline. Yes, sir. Um, one of the things we talked about in our meeting last night was the essential nature of mentorships and of us not dragging our feet anymore at training not even just young people, but more than one person at different tasks, whether it's all of the things that Matt is sort of the expert of, all the things that Andy's the expert of, um, the things that Mark has been doing in the back. The, the idea of not, not training people to do those things is there's not, there's not really an excuse for it. Uh, because number one, number one, we, no one person needs the load of a thing on them. Um, and number two, when someone learns and is equipped to be able to serve in different ways within the church under someone who has been successful in that area, 
it gives them confidence in what they're learning, but also gives them ownership in the ministry. So that as they're growing in their spirituality, they're, they're going to be, you might say, they're going to be much less likely to think, what's the big deal if I'm a part of this, right? Well, no, they, they, they have seen, you know what, this functions uh, well because you do have ownership in it. And that's one of the good things about the, this habanero visitation ministry. I really don't like the name. But uh, this ministry that we have adopted that we're trying to, to work our way through is just something that gives everybody something to do if they'll do it. And we've had a lot more participation than we have before. This is a good uh, discussion that I didn't plan on having. <laughs> um, let's see here. All right, who wants to get into the historical background of Philippi? It's not as interesting as our conversation that we're having right now. Okay, wait, I have another map here that zooms in a little bit. Did I hear someone comment? Uh, we have here um, a little zoomed in, Neapolis, Philippi, Amphipolis, Thessalonica, Berea, and um, I'm hopefully you're already ahead of me on where, where you see all of these cities plus Athens, Corinth uh, within the narrative of, of Acts. But now this, if you look where Philippi is there, it's described as sort of being kind of in a little bit of a valley. It's, it's maybe 15, 10 or 15 miles or so from the coast. And, and so if anyone's traveling east to west from Europe into Asia, they're probably going to pass through this spot unless they take a boat. It's the easiest spot to go through, sort of like how Corinth is a main trade area as well from different sides. You know, they would, sometimes they would pull a boat all the way across the five miles across uh, through Corinth rather than going around the, the southern part here. You see, they would pull it across right here instead of going around, if you remember that. But Philippi was significant for that reason. And in the third, fourth century B.C., there was a guy named Philip II of Macedon. Now, Macedon is where? Macedonia. There we go. Macedon. The older you, see, when you go further back, the names are a little bit different, right? But it's okay. Like Jerusalem used to be Salem, where the Jebusites. Je, okay. So you, over time, these names kind of changed. So Philip II. Uh, he was, I think he was born in like 380-something, okay? And here's what he did. He went to this area and established a city there because just south of the city is the, is the mountain or the hills of, I know it sounds like penguin, but it's, it's pangolin or something. It's, it's different spellings of it, but the mountain or the hills of penguin. And the, these, this mountain range or these hills, they, are, they were rich with gold. And it was estimated that they mined out of these hills about a thousand talents of gold every year. Now, we're looking at the parables of Jesus and how much one talent of gold is worth. And a, but what, 10,000 talents was something between six billion and $30 billion, right? So, so let's just, you know, take one decimal place or take one comma zero off of that uh, and we go down a little bit to 1,000 talents a year that they're just that they're just it's coming out of nowhere out of this mountain range and this Philip named the city after himself Philippi and he was sort of the self-proclaimed ruler of Macedonia And because of his great wealth that he kind of kept all for himself, he was able to amass for himself a great army because he wanted to expand his influence. And I believe it was 336 B.C. that he was assassinated. And his wealth and his army were then handed off to his son. Do you know who his son was? You know this guy. Any guesses? Because this, this speaks to the significance of the place. Alexander the Great. Okay. 
So, so Philipp, Philippi was sort of ground zero for where the power of Alexander the Great kind of came from. It's named after his father who got the gold, and I think after a while the gold mines dried up and the city kind of dwindled a little bit more. There were some, it was, it was a place of a lot of historical events. In 42 BC, there was a battle between Octavius and, uh, let's see, Octavius and, and Mark Antony. They were on one side, and Brutus and Cassius were on the other side of the Republic of Rome. And there in 42 BC, uh, Brutus and Cassius were defeated by Octavius and Mark Antony, uh, and Octavius became recognized as the first Caesar. A couple of years earlier, Julius Caesar had been assassinated. We all know that story. And so Octavius becomes Augustus Caesar, who is kind of recognized, even though he's not the first Caesar per se, he's the first recognized as as uh, emperor, but I think maybe that took another decade or so before he was recognized. But that happened at this place. So you might say that the spark that started the power behind Alexander the Great started in Philippi, and a decisive battle that uh, you might say that uh, accelerated the Roman Republic into what we know as the Roman Empire happened in this place as well at the battle at the battle of Philippi of course over time this this city was on one of the main thoroughfares called the Ignatian Way which was about a 500 mile interstate system if you will something like that it was it was one of the major roads and it went through this place you fast forward into the first century in the time of Christ and the time that the gospel finally reaches Philippi, the city was a very, very, uh, very Roman city. It was, it's, it's referred to as a Roman colony, but it was, when I say very, very Roman, I mean the idea of its cultural background because Here's what it became known for and what it was when Paul got there. It was a place where Roman soldiers would come to retire. So Philippi was a kind of a, a nice place. It was sort of like the Florida of the Roman Empire. It's where the soldiers went to retire when they got old. And so it was a place where they had, they had some, when we think of the culture of the place, the population consisted of people who elevated ideas of honor and of courage and of duty and things like that. It kind of gives you the idea of the type of people that Paul encountered when he got there, even though it wasn't just Rome, Romans and Roman citizens. Also, as it was Paul's uh, habit, what was Paul's habit when he went into a city? Where would he go and preach? He would go to the synagogue, right? Well, when he goes into Philippi, how long does he stay in the synagogue? Do you remember? That's a trick question. He didn't go to the synagogue because there probably wasn't a synagogue. And usually if there were 10 Jews or maybe 10 families of Jews, uh, they were required to have a synagogue, which means they may not have had even 10 Jews in the whole city. No synagogue which still gives you a little bit better of an idea of the cross-section, the type of people that are in it. It's, it is of the, of the travels of Paul. I don't know if I could say the travels of Paul, but, but very likely of the travels of Paul and of the letters of Paul, it is, the audience is the most Roman, or you might say the least Jewish audience that we have. Okay, what do we got here? Our time's almost up. All right, let's have a little reminder here. You see this list here. This column is, in chronological order, the writings of Paul. We have Philippians right in here. 
one of the prison epistles, the four prison epistles, in his second imprisonment. You have the list of all the cities within the, the missionary journeys. And at the beginning of the second missionary journey, he comes through, and right here, chapter 16 of Acts, verse 12, is where he ends up in Philippi. So he goes the first missionary journey and comes back at the end of Acts 14. At the beginning of Acts 15, he hears about how they're trying to, to figure out how to navigate the traditions of the Jews. So they go from Antioch down to Jerusalem to have the Jerusalem Council. And it's probably, it's probably while he's in Antioch, before he goes down there, that he writes Galatians. After that, he goes back up to Antioch. After they, the Holy Spirit uh, told them sort of the basics, you can read that in, in Acts 15, the basics of what they need to do about the Jewish tradition issue. And so at the end of Acts 15, we have the travel situation sort of warming up or getting started up for the second missionary journey. And so let's see, let's, we're going to look at, if you want to open your Bible, we're going to go to Acts 15 at the end. And here's what I want us to do. We'll do this and then we'll get back into it on Sunday morning. We'll get as far as we can. Well, all I want to do is, is start at the end of Acts 15 and read through Acts 16. Because Acts 16 all takes place, well, not all of it takes place, but uh, Acts, Acts 16, a lot of it takes place at Philippi. And there's a lot that's said, and there are a lot of characters that Paul meets. And there are things that happen. And as we go through it, I want you to make mental notes. And I'll kind of emphasize them. I mean, they're right there in the text. They just make mental notes of the different characters that he meets, the different people that he interacts with. And, and you might say, think about what it is that the Holy Spirit through Luke is showing us about Paul's interaction there in Philippi. Because we need to build this sort of this background of what, what was his first interaction there? And why is it so important that he has such a good relationship with them? What happened when he got there and how he left? Now, of course, I will say this. After he left, we don't really have a record of him going back. Even though we know that he did, we just don't have a record of it because there's a lot that, that Luke doesn't talk about. Okay, so Acts 15, starting at verse 39. There arose a sharp disagreement so that they separated from each other. Barnabas took Mark with him and sailed away to Cyprus because Paul didn't want to hang out with, with John Mark. Remember that? But Paul chose Silas and departed, having been commended by the brothers to the grace of the Lord. And he went through Syria and Cilicia, strengthening the churches. Okay, so who, who do we have traveling companions? We have Barnabas is going to Cyprus with who? With John Mark. And Paul is going with who? Traveling. Paul and Silas. Now, who is in prison in Philippi in the next chapter? Do you remember? Paul and Silas. Okay. But I just want us to keep track of who, who is in the traveling party here. Acts, six, uh, Acts 16, starting in verse 1. Paul came also to Derbe and Lystra. A disciple was there named Timothy. This is the first, this is our introduction to Timothy. The son of a Jewish woman who was a believer. But his father was a Greek. He was well spoken of by the brothers at Lystra and Iconium. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was a Greek. As they went on their way through the cities, they delivered to them for observance the decisions that had been reached by the apostles and elders who were in Jerusalem. And you can go back and you can read that document in Acts 15. They just take that document and they're delivering it. So the churches were strengthened in the faith, and they increased in numbers daily. Verse 6. And they went through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been forbidden by the Holy Spirit to speak the word in Asia. And when they had come to Mysia, they attempted to go into Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them. So passing by Mysia, they went down to Troas, and a vision appeared to Paul in the night. Troas is a, is a coastal city. A vision appeared 
to Paul in the night. A man of Macedonia was standing there, urging him and saying, Come over to Macedonia and help us. And when Paul had seen the vision, immediately we sought to go into Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to preach the gospel to them. So, who now is going to Macedonia? Who's the first one? Paul? Paul and I hear you whispering. You just say it. Silas, Timothy, and the personal pronoun becomes plural, first person, we. So somewhere right in here, Luke joins them. So we have these four that we know at least. Paul, Silas, Timothy, and Luke. They're, they are, they've been called to go into Macedonia. If you remember, Macedonia is right where Philippi is the center of. Philip of Macedon was the ruler, self-proclaimed, of Macedonia. So that's where they're going. They're going to go into Macedonia. Verse 11. So setting sail from Troas, we made a direct voyage to Samothrace and, and the following day to Neapolis. From there to Philippi, Neapolis is the coastal city, which is a leading city of the district of Macedonia and a Roman colony. We remained in this city some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside to, outside the gate to the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer. And we sat down and spoke to the women who had come together. Now, remember, they didn't go where? Where did they not go because it didn't exist? A synagogue. And they're like, well... We're gonna live, we, need, we know there's probably some religious people somewhere, right? And um, a colleague of mine or professor that I know, um, Terry Edwards, I heard him do a really great lecture on, on Philippians when, at, at Polish in the Pulpit one year. And he goes there and does tours in Philippi. And he, used, he grew up in Italy. His, uh, gra- his father was the dean in, of my graduate school. And he's known as the apostle to the Italians. It's kind of his nickname because he was there for years. And so he grew up around these locations and knows the guides and knows the people who live in these areas, which is kind of a cool thing, right? But every year he goes there and takes people, they all know him. And he said that he thinks he knows the creek there where they went and found people praying. And it's an interesting thing that you can go and you could possibly find the same little waterway there where they found Lydia. Now, where was I? Okay, verse 13. On the Sabbath day, we went outside the gate of the riverside where we supposed there was a place of prayer, and we sat down and spoke to the women who had got, come together. One who heard us was a woman named Lydia from the city of Thyatira, a seller of purple goods, who was a worshiper of God. Kind of reminds you of who? In Acts chapter 10. Kind of reminds you of Cornelius, right? The Lord opened her heart to pay attention to what was said by Paul. And after she was baptized, and her household as well, she urged us, saying, If you have judged me to be faithful to the Lord, come to my my house and stay. And she prevailed against us. Our time is up, and I just want to mention about Lydia. It is thought that what Lydia was trading in was something that would have been very expensive. It's sort of like someone who owned a yacht club, Maybe not exactly like that, but it was something that high-end people would purchase. And so Lydia might be what you might think of as sort of an upper-class, highfalutin kind of a person, possibly. And uh, that's just something to think about as we go through and we look at the other characters. Um, our time is up, though, and we will, we'll start right there as we'll go through, continue to look at Paul's first visit to Philippi. Any comments about any of this or questions about any of this background stuff? Any other comments about our earlier discussion? It is. I'm, I'm having a great time studying just, just for myself. Uh, let's just have a quick prayer and we'll be dismissed. Father, we thank you so much for times like this. You're, you're so good to us. You're better, than we de- better to us than we deserve for you to be. We can't thank you enough. 
Um, thank you for your word. Thank you for each other, for encouragement, for being emboldened, uh, for seeing examples of people who went before us believing in your son and having confidence in you and seeking after your will. Help us as we study this to be emboldened and strengthened in, in our desire and perseverance to do your will. And all this we ask in your son's name. Amen.